Welcome to the School for Good Living podcast. I'm your host, Brian Miller. I know that the world can work for everyone, but that it won't until it works for you. I've created this podcast to help you make the difference you were born to make. It's a series of conversations with thought leaders who are moving humanity forward. Most of my guests are authors, and in each episode, I explore their life journeys and the work they do. I also ask them to break down how they've gotten their books written, published, and read so that you can use these same strategies and tactics too. So if you have a mission, a message, and the motivation to share it, this podcast is for you. Welcome to the School for Good Living. Hello, my friends. Today, I am so pleased to share with you a conversation I just had with Greg McKeon, author of the New York Times bestseller, Essentialism, The Disciplined Pursuit of Less. Greg is an amazing thinker and teacher. He's taught at companies that include Apple, Google, Facebook, Salesforce, LinkedIn, Semantic, Twitter, VMware. And he was recently named a young global leader by the World Economic Forum. He just moved to Southern California. He's got four kids. He has an MBA from Stanford University. He is truly wise beyond his years. In this conversation, he shares about a lot of things, including culture. He says it's the one thing you can't lie about in an organization talks about leadership, things that he's learned in his career as a consultant and as an advisor to some of the world's leading companies, talks about we're always leading all the time, gives some insight into how to do that more effectively. He breaks down, of course, the philosophy of the essentialist, which I will leave it to you to hear directly from him, but he talks about it as a contrast to the default setting for almost everyone who are non-essentialists. He talks about developing the gift of discernment, filling your mind with light, the power and value of thinking. I love one of the things he says when you're reading, you're thinking with someone else's mind. So we explore a bit of time talking about books, how to choose them, how to make the most of them. Craig talks about the power of cumulative consistency, celebrating what's right. And he also talks about creating residual streams of goodness. So I'm so excited for you to hear this conversation. If you haven't read Essentialism, I highly recommend you do. There were about a half dozen people who told me how much it had impacted them before I finally got around to reading it myself. If you haven't read it, I think you'll find many great ideas that you'll love. And I think you'll love this conversation. So with no further words from me, please enjoy my conversation with Greg McEwen. Greg, welcome to the School for Good Living podcast. It's great to be with you. Thank you. I have a brother named Greg. He's my oldest brother. He's the oldest. I'm the youngest. Um, don't, don't, you're, sorry, hold on. You're the youngest? That's right. Youngest of five. I'm youngest of five, too. We, how many boys? Taking, how many girls? Four boys, one girl. Same here. No. Oh, Amazing. Where does, the girl fit, where does the girl fit in? Second youngest. Second from, she's just older than me. It's the same. Are you serious? That yeah, is I'm wild. Serious. Holy cow! Yeah, the, the the old my 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 older sister and brother, right up from me, so second, third youngest, are twins. But she she came out second. So wow! What's so it like? far it's what's... matching. What's the <laughs> what's the age gap? So the oldest, oldest and is, is about twelve years older than me. Okay, in my case, it's eight years. Eight. So wow, your family was you were busy. Yeah, it was connected. <laughs> it, was, it was it's tightly connected. Amazing. Uh, so we we have to have like a, we have to have a club. We have to have a club for youngest people in the world. I love That's it. What I think. That's what I think. Because of course everybody says that the youngest are spoiled. And even if you say that to an oldest person in a family, they will say yes, of course that is true. But they don't. Yeah. They, 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 this is an underappreciated challenge to be the youngest. That's what I think. I think so. And I, I often think of, I don't remember who the comedian was that talked about, you know, the first is the one that the parents are so worried about and stringent and there's all these rules and expectations. And by the time you get to the youngest, it's kind of like no Coke in the living room and don't set anything on fire. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> totally relaxed. That's true. That's no, that's the, that's, that's the upside. The downside <laughs> is the downside is it doesn't really matter what you achieve at least in the early days because everyone's already passed that phase. So it doesn't yeah. matter anymore. The exams and so on, at least that's how it felt for me. Was that how it was for you? You know, for me, um, 
I, I, not so much. I mean, my parents were always very supportive of each of us doing whatever we wanted. So we weren't really the kind of family that was like, you got to be top of the class. You got to make the, the football team or whatever. So I don't think I had that experience. Well, I agree with that, that it, my, my experience was also that way. There wasn't pressure to perform. It was just by the time I was taking exams, the, made, the big exams in England, everyone else was on to the next thing. So it didn't matter as much anymore, at least it appeared to. And so I did, I did decently well. And, uh, and, and it, it was just never, it just never, it just seemed like a, I don't know, enough about, enough about my family of origin. We, 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 <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we better stop while we get, while we're ahead. Well, let, let me ask you this, um, talking about family, I understand that you toured when your wife was a part of Beauty and the Beast. That you went around the country or maybe the world with Disney is that is that right? And if so, will you tell me a little bit about what that was like? It was my crash course in Americana. Um, I, as you rightly say, my wife Anna was the understudy in the national tour of Beauty and the Beast, uh, which is a big deal, and so it means that she performed as Belle to forty times or something like that in that year, and. Uh, but, performed in the show 300 times, which means I have heard or seen part of, I don't think it's a, not 300, but it is exceedingly many times. Um, uh, seeing the show and we went to 20, as I remember, 26 cities in that year. So all across North America. And uh, we, we went, we went to places that even now I've never gone back to despite uh, having pursued a career that that uh, that does include, you know, a lot of travel throughout the world and also in North America. So, so I travel so forty or fifty times a, a year, speaking at, at conferences uh, and companies, but still haven't gone back to Lubbock, Texas, for example. Uh, more's the pity. Uh, and, but we went there and, uh, and 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 just traveled all around. It was a, a marvelous first year of of, of our marriage. Wow. What what did you learn about America? What were what were some of your impressions and what stayed with you from that? Um, well, it, it, we've that's an interesting question. I that means I don't know that I have a good answer. Um, the you know, I was struck by certain places, certain places had. And I won't say where because it just doesn't seem quite quite right, but seemed tremendously underdeveloped. And I don't mean Lubbock, Texas, for having just mentioned that as the only name that I've mentioned. But there were places that seemed almost not part of the rest of America, almost uh, like a, a, I described it at the time um, as, as almost second worldish. Um, in in you know the, the 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 roads weren't working. That the something wasn't working there. So even though you're in the United States, even though you are um, in the middle of all of this uh, this prosperity and success, something wasn't working there. And 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 I at least have have hypothesized that what was going on was was a different approach to leadership. I mean, you could even sense that that there was something. That, that that may be very unwise choices, even worse than that. Very, very little, little little darkness in high places um, that had that had meant that underneath in those areas, you know, maybe maybe sort of the edge of corruption or just corruption. I mean, there was there was that sort of feeling in certain places. So so when you see places in quick succession, you can have an immediate sense of them. And even now, I feel like the same observation can be made when I'm working with organizations that um, that you, you walk in and the thing you can't lie about in organizations, the thing you can't is the culture. That's what I think the culture is. It's what it's what you cannot put away. It's what you can't hide anywhere. It is always on display. And so you can walk into I can walk into some organizations, some rooms, and there's so much energy and light and positivity for each other and for learning and for and then some of the groups it is silent dead uh other groups there's a there's a sort of um uh um, a cynicism and a kind of harshness with each other and all of these things 
you can't hide. Uh, they're, they're the natural consequences of other decisions and other investments. So I observed that when we were traveling uh, and, uh, and, and observed also, you know, can, continuing through now into the work that I've done in organizations. You know, I, I think what you're talking about, about leadership and, and how culture is the one thing you can't lie about in an organization. Um, I'm glad you brought up leadership. It's something I want to ask you about. I understand that in your career, you've done a lot of work around assessing leaders and um, developing leaders. And um, one of the things I want to I want to ask about first is if you'll talk a little bit about what your work in that in that um, realm has been. And then I want to ask a little bit about how, like, what makes a great leader and, and are leaders born or made? Will, will you say a little bit about that? Yeah, I think that, I think that leadership is something everybody can, everybody has a certain amount of leadership, uh, skill, talent, uh, capability from the outset. And, but, but everybody can develop, you know, significantly from that point. And so, uh, so maybe, maybe you're not likely to have somebody who's a terrible leader become a truly great leader, perhaps, but, uh, but you, I think anyone can develop, can develop, you know, a standard deviation or two over become uh, become a, a better leader. Uh, I mean, I think that all of us, all of us are leading all of the time. So, so the question is, is whether we are doing that consciously rather than compulsively and whether we're, and whether we're taking people in the right direction or in some other direction. Uh, I mean, I mean, there's a sort of assumption when you use the word leadership in some circles that leadership, you know, is inherently positive. Oh, we've got to develop leaders in our organization. And I always think you, you must put a word before it. What kind of leadership do you want? Because everybody's leading. Leadership is influence. Leadership is trying to take someone from point A to point B. And we're all doing that all of the time. We're trying to get even the minorest ideas, right? Let's eat at this place versus that place. Let's, uh, you know, I'm sending you an email. I want you to do something. I mean, all of this is leadership. It's influence. So the question is, is how do we, how do we develop um, the, the right kind of leadership for this time and situation? How do we develop the kind of leadership necessary uh, to help in these conditions? So to me, that's, that's always been the most interesting question around leadership. What type of leadership is most relevant now? You look at uh, Winston Churchill uh, in England, and yeah, he, he's a political pariah prior to the Second World War. He's, his, his views on Hitler, on uh, what's going on in Germany at the time, is, is, is way out of the mainstream. And his stylistically, he's out of the mainstream. Uh, you know, he has all these character peccadillos that, that make him unusual. And all of that is, I mean, he's surely the same basic thing then as he is a year later, once suddenly his particular understanding of the world and his particular approach to leading is suddenly drawn into the highest relevancy. And... So, and, 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 and of course, it goes on beyond that after the war, those particular skills don't seem to be as relevant anymore. And he's, you know, he's thrown out of office and because it, despite being this great war hero, uh, he's, uh, it's, it's no longer what people need. And so in a similar way, I, I'm always curious and uh, and looking for well in these conditions that we are in today what is the kind of leader you'd need what what is going to help now and uh and, and so this is this is one of the reasons that i am to, so taken and so well i went on to name uh the, the a, a new type of leader uh an essentialist 
because I think in this environment, in a, in a cultural environment where we, so very many of us feel busy but not productive, stretched too thin at work or at home, um, feeling like our day is being constantly hijacked by other people's agenda, whether through email or tweets or updates in news or just, uh, of course, phone calls and, and texts and so on, just constant disruption and interruption in that environment what's the kind what kind of leader is needed um and, and i think that uh in a in a different time and place it, it might not be an essentialist that might not be really the thing there's other principles of leadership that really matter but i think in this environment this has the power of relevancy and in a sense i've been a little bit lucky about that because that's why i think the book is has done as well as it's done and, and continues to outperform expectations is because it's the environment that makes it relevant, that says this, this is an idea whose time has come. Yeah, I, I think you're, I think you're right on. And, um, you know, your book just is, I first read it two and a half or three years ago and it, it made an impact on me then. Um, and it, it just keeps coming up for me. You know, I'm a member of EO, the Entrepreneurs Organization, and we just had a couple of new members join our chapter here. And so they did their all day training um, Wednesday. And I mentioned that I'd be talking with you and they shared that essentialism was a topic of discussion, you know, in their, in that chapter training and being clear about what's important and, and having the discipline to pursue it. And I have... Um, I have a couple other friends that when they learned that I'd be talking with you, they, they had a couple questions they wanted me to be sure that I asked. So I think you're right. It's really just resonant um, right now. One of the things did, I want to ask. What did, they want, what did they want you to ask? Well, one of the things is this paradox between letting go, like being a yes to life, you know, like kind of the ethos in um, Singer's The Surrender Experiment. Right. Like being open to possibility, you know, accepting whatever life offers and yet being really clear about what you're committed to and what's most important, how to balance that. In fact, the question as it's written, how does one live a life free of burden of expectation while still holding growth and expansion as values and not turn down opportunities that could lead to transformational change? It's kind of a big question. <laughs> <laughs> Now, How do you who came up with that? that? Who who came up with that question? This is John Brown. It's sense of style. <laughs> John, so John Brown wrote that question verbatim. That was it. I read it exactly as John, it came to me. John. Uh, yeah. So the, there's a there's a tension there, isn't there? Um, and we don't want we don't want to resolve that tension. We, meaning we don't want to get rid of it. You, you, there's, there are dualities in life. And if you try and take one piece of it without the other piece, you end up with something very false. So if you take the two pieces he's saying, for example, how do you live a life sort of free of burden or unhelpful burden, but on the other open uh, leaning in to to growth and challenge, you, you don't want to take either of those separately. Like if somebody just says, "Okay, I want to live a life completely free of all responsibility and burdens," that is not going to end up being a satisfying life. That's uh, you're just drifting through life. But on the other hand, if everything is always must grow, must add, must challenge. It, then that too will become the person that does that will will, will end up um, you, you know destroying the asset that is them. Uh, it happened to uh, to a friend of mine and I wrote about it in essentialism. Uh, so uh, true story. Uh, he he was doing incredible contribution, making a great contribution, traveling all over the world. And, and then he, he didn't notice that it was siphoning off more and more of his deep 
reservoir of energy and, and, and discernment until the point that by the time he noticed, he goes to the doctors just going, okay, something is clearly off. The doctor said, okay, we'll go home. You could have, you're going to really need to rest a lot um, to be able to try and work out what's going on and also start to, to put back these depleted resources. He said, okay. I think the doctor said, oh, you're going to need six weeks of this. He said, ah, I'm, I'm such a driver. I just need two weeks. You watch this. I'll be back. Well, he went and started sleeping and he almost stopped, never stopped sleeping. He, 16 hours a day of sleep, just constant sleep. And eventually, after two weeks, he just crawls back to the doctor. He says, OK, I get it. I, I, I can see now that my body's taking over and reclaiming, uh, you know, what sort of rightfully uh, belongs to it. And, and so in the end, it took him like years of recuperation. And his lesson from all of it was this, protect the asset. You've got to protect the asset. That's a powerful um, phrase that's, that, that, was, that was expensive to learn that for him. And we can learn it. We can benefit from that, uh, from that insight. So I think that actually that principle captures the tension. You, you want to make a contribution. Essentialism is not about just saying no. It, it's, I didn't write a book called Noism. Essentialism is not about doing less for the sake of less. It's about making your highest and best contribution in life. And in order to do that, you must protect the asset. So it's this happy tension between protecting the asset that is you, sleeping, uh, creating space to look at your life rather than just constantly reacting to it, uh, planning daily, weekly, quarterly, having a personal quarterly offsite so that you can really see where your life is going. All of that is in the first category. And the second is you do the first in order to make the best and highest contribution you can make so that you can live, fulfill, complete your essential mission in life. So it's, it's the perpetual discipline pursuit of both of those things. Mm -hmm. And it's built into the model of essentialism. This essentialism has really three parts to it, is create space to explore what is essential, explore, eliminate what's not essential, so that you can then build a system that makes it as effortless as possible to complete what is essential. So back to his question, you got to explore so that you aren't just doing what other people have told you to do. You aren't just doing what everyone else is doing. Yeah. That's not you, you, that's just going along. That's the fear of missing out. That's FOMO. So you've got to you've got to pause. Look at all of what people are doing. Fine. Look at everything that you're doing. Look at all the ideas you have. Explore broadly, deeply, boldly but then become really selective from it. So you aren't just doing what other people are doing for the sake of because they're doing it. And in that, you actually start to discover the joy of missing out or JOMO because you start to say, I'm pursuing a particular strategy that is helping me to be utilized at my highest point of contribution. And then you can start building your own system, your own uh, machine uh, for continually producing the results that you have identified as being the most important, the most valuable. Yeah, that, that's such a huge, that's such a huge insight. And I remember uh, when I was working inside our family business that I got to a point where I just felt defeated at the end of every day, trying to make um, a motorsports park my dad built with no business plan profitable. And, and we ran it for a decade before we, we wait, you know, threw in the towel on that. But every day it was just disappointment and anger and sadness and frustration. And I remember one night on a walk with my wife that what I got clear was even though I might not produce the result I wanted, if at the end of every day I could say I focused on the most important things and I used my time as well as I could, how could I possibly be upset with myself? If there was something more important, I would have done it. If I had more time, I would have used it. And that's what I'm hearing in, in what you're saying. And, and that really was and, – and, you know, honestly – I think that was about the time I read your book that it made 
and I hadn't connected it, but I, I don't think it's a coincidence that that shift happened in my life around the same time. So that's a really beautiful, beautiful thing you're pointing to. Well, and something that you, something you made me think about at least is just the importance of permission. I think that, I think that essentialism, the book and more, more importantly, the philosophy, right? I mean, I'm just naming and when I came up with the term essentialism, it's just trying to name something that, of course, predates it. Um, and I think in in the essentialism, there is inherent permission to not do what you've been doing. Mm-hmm. That most people know, <clears throat> excuse me, logically, you could make a different choice. That you don't have to do what you're doing. Most people know that 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 it is factually true that you can choose not to do what you're doing but practically and emotionally i think that they really do not know that they could do something different yeah, yeah it doesn't they feel really that do way. believe yeah it does not feel that way and so if it doesn't feel that way and doesn't seem that way then practically it is not that way for someone and so yeah. you actually have to introduce permission, not permission from their boss, not permission from, although all those things could help, um, but but permission just so that the idea becomes um, renewed within them. I yeah. can make a different choice. I do not have to do what I've been doing in the past. I do not have to hold on to those ideas. I can choose a different way. A different path, and and that has to happen for people to become an essentialist because non-essentialism is so pervasive now. It is a default setting for almost everybody in in the developed country. That that there is so much noise, there is so much interruption, there is so many options, there is so much noise that y- y- if you just look around, well, what's everyone else doing? You which we do even even not consciously we're just I mean, we're, we're we're um i mean humans are everything we learn at first we learn by copying and i don't think that changes very much as we go through our lives we, we it's our def- that is that's how we learn things right that's how we learned language that's how we learn to walk we're watching around how do people do it and then we try and start doing it it's, it's a very um it's a it, it's 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 a, um, sort of copyism so that continues into uh, high school, it continues into college, it continues into workplace environment. So if other people are behaving a certain way, we're going to start behaving that way. That is the default. And the default today is all this endless business and so on. That's what people observe other people doing. So if they take the path of least resistance, they will wake up as a non-essentialist. And they will have followed a path, a strategy that I think most people would not deliberately choose. But because it's default, they just define that they're just doing it. They don't even think that, well, there are two options. I could be an essentialist or a non-essentialist. I'll be a non-essentialist. It's not like that. And so once you can introduce this language, that's, uh, that's right. In some ways, the most important contribution of, of essentialism is give, give people language so they can talk about this, so they can, they can conceptualize what well, might be a different path. The way of the essentialist is an alternative. I could, I could, I could make a different choice. I could become an essentialist and start thinking about my life in a completely different way than I have been previously. And, and that's yeah. when I think the subject starts to become exciting. I, I totally agree with you. And one thing, one thing I'd love to get your perspective about in this conversation. I know you talk about this in your book, but for those listening or maybe who haven't read it. So it's one thing to talk about focus, you know, on the the important few, like and do it deliberately and, and this, the, the disciplined pursuit of less but better. But as a practical matter, how how can people know? Like how can they how can they be clear? I mean, I as a coach, I talk to so many people who don't know what they want. Right? Like how can people find out what it is they want before they you know, because that seems like such an essential component of what you're talking about doing. How can we get clear? Like, how can we, whatever? I mean, is it listening to your heart? Is it, you know, being guided by your inner child, your higher self? Is it like, how do people do it? And how do they know 
when they've done it and they're not just like deluding themselves or they're not going to want something different tomorrow, you know, that kind of thing? Um, well, there's two questions, I think, here. Um, one is, one is how to, how to discover it. And the second is how to know once you have discovered it, right? There's the, yeah. there's the, you know, so how do you, how do you find it <clears throat> and how do you recognize it once you have those are those are two different things the how to find it is well let's start with what it's not it is not an undisciplined pursuit of what everyone else is doing it's not just going along it, 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 similarly it's not going along with what everybody else is doing without really thinking about it and once a year, a decade, going to some workshop somewhere, having some conversation with somebody and going, well, what do I really want? This is necessary, fine, but totally insufficient. Because the path to finding this kind of clarity, it, it is that this is the work of life. So it's a perpetual, disciplined pursuit. It's a pursuit. Yeah. A continual pursuit. So I think in some ways, in some ways, there's only two kinds of people in the world. There are people who are lost. Uh, that, that's the non-essentialist. And then there are people who know they are lost. <laughs> and that's the essentialist. And the difference it makes all the difference in the world. Because if you wake up and you know you're lost, if you know you don't really know what to do, then you start to do all the right things. You start to say, well, okay, well, where am I? Okay, well, I start to start to keep a journal. Okay, this is what's going on in my life. And you start saying, okay, well, where have I come from? It, over time, you can start doing that with with your journal. Go back and read it. Well, what has been going on? What what have I been learning? What's what, what connecting the dots? Okay, so then wh where do I want to go in the future? And and st suddenly you're not you, you're asking the right questions as soon as you admit you're lost. You start to ask the right questions and it's it's none of it's actually rocket science, right? None of this is actually that complex or it doesn't strike me as that complex anyway. Where am I? Where have I been? Where do I want to go? But the discipline to keep asking it every day, every week, every quarter, constantly it is a perpetual. It is the work. It's the work of life. That's the that's the way. That's the path. So, so I don't feel like I don't feel like I have in my own life any special, um, uh, you know, uh, ability in in this area. I feel like I just work so much harder on these questions than what I observe other people doing. So it's just nonstop. It is, to me, it's. What's the best use of me? What's the most important thing I could do? What's the most important thing I could do next? What's the most valuable thing I could do today? L let's just keep asking it. Let's keep, you've got to be in the process of asking these questions constantly or you just get pulled into the alternative path. And, and, and the risk of that is, the, the cost of that is very high, I think, because then you end up living, pursuing a strategy you wouldn't have pursued or you don't want to pursue and it end up with the results you didn't want to get. So, yeah, well, and then that's and the what way you're saying. Yeah, I, I love what you're saying that that is the work of life. And I, I that totally resonates with me. And at the same time, what I see is I think our culture is, as a society, we're so we're so mind oriented. We're so we're intellectual. We we're drawn you know to the empirical. If we can't repeat it or observe it, it's not, you know, <laughs> true or whatever. I mean, so what I'm wondering is how do you balance then this intellectual exercise, which it's, it is if we're asking and answering questions using, you know, our, our minds with the intuitive or the emotional faculties we have as well? How do you, how do you balance that? Well, that leads us to the second part of the, the question and the answer is how do you know when you get there? Um, I mean, I, I actually don't think, although I, I, I think, I don't think that asking questions 
asking the right questions is intellectual only. In fact, I, I'm, I feel confident of that. The right, you can, ask, you can ask questions just intellectually and just get intellectual answers. And I think that means you're not asking the right questions. To ask the right questions, you do need to be tapping into both mind and heart. You know, how do you we wake up in the morning? The default questions that uh, that or very intellectual questions that will take somebody completely off path. Uh, but you you got to listen to conscience. You've got to be able to educate and then and uh, to be able to recognize the voice of conscience guiding you, speaking to you. I think it's always available, but you have to tap into it. And so, one of the things I think is absolute must. I, mean, I already talked about journaling, and we can talk more about that. I, I, I now, I now never miss. Right, like, so I don't think I've missed a day in, you know, I don't know, seven and a half years, something like what, that. What does your journaling practice currently look like? Um, it's uh, I, I frame everything, literally every entry through, through the gratitude lens. Um, so every, everything begins with, I am thankful for, even if it's a negative, <laughs> um, it's surprisingly powerful actually, even to do that. I'm thankful that this thing happened and, and, it, and saying thankful means that you actually, I mean, something just happened the other day that wasn't great. I'm thankful that this happened. And as soon as I started writing it in that way, I was like, and thank goodness it didn't go this way as it could easily have done much worse than it actually went. And the gratitude still restored a certain perspective. So you don't get. You don't fall down into, uh, into sort of um, uh, negative cycles, which I think are, are just um, are seeing the world falsely. Where did you learn the power of gratitude? Where did you, I mean, obviously doing proves it, but where? Wh how did this come to be such a significant practice for you? I, I read, I wrote, um, I wrote, I wrote in a journal pretty consistently for pretty much my whole life. But not every day, you know, um, that was also always the aspiration. And then a few years ago, I think right around this time, seven and a half years ago, I, I'd, I'd watched something about uh, a leader uh, who I admired, who said, I started, he said, I started writing a journal. He said, I just wrote a few sentences every day. No matter how early I was waking up the next morning, how late it was, I would I would never miss a day. He said, I, I didn't miss a day for years. And in it, he would write, he was trying to find, see his question, the question that was guiding his entries were, where have I seen the hand of God in my life? And I, and he said that the question revealed answers. He, he saw things he wouldn't have seen otherwise. And so the example of that was impactful to me. It made me think, uh, first of all, if it, with all that he has going on, he can do it, then I can do it. And so that would put away the excuses. And also, it was just a few sentences a day. So that was important because you need an upper and lower bound on new goals. And so this was my, um, this was my uh, upper bound. It was just a few sentences. And... And I just started experimenting from there with it and was amazed, just amazed at how many good things are going on in the midst of even when when trouble's going on, even when something isn't working the way you want it to work, which, of course, is every day. It's constantly that you, there are <laughs> things not how you want them to be yet. Of course, problems everywhere. But yeah. to look at those problems through the lens of gratitude is immensely powerful, uh, you know, perspective. And I was just estimating recently, I started to look through some of my old journals and as an estimate, uh, you know, in that, in the, just in the last seven plus years, uh, I would think I've written something like 10,000 things now that I'm grateful wow. for. So it's added Amazing. up. Yeah. It's added up. And, and you can't, you can't claim that your life is no, is somehow no good when you have, uh, 10,000 items that you're, you know, that you're thankful for over that period of time. And so, and that, and that's exactly the right idea is that, is that our lives aren't really that good. Yeah, no, oh, that that that's beautiful. Well, and I know as I was asking about your writing, I, I took us off the path a little bit of you responding to this about how we can tap into the heart and know when we found what it is that we want. Will you will you talk a little bit more about that and guided by conscience and what you were saying earlier? 
Yeah, this is, I mean, this is the whole thing, right? Is, is you, it, you have got to develop the gift of discernment. So, you, and, and I see them as, as, as parallel. You need, you need the, the parity between, uh, between the logical that, that's, that's trying to, to answer, you know, to trying to think through things, uh, you know, uh, trying to work things out in your mind is really important, including, well, what's the most important stuff that I should be doing? I mean, using uh, our, well, God-given intellect seems really important. And in addition to that, combined with that, uh, we need also this ability to discern the right path, something that resonates completely. And I think that's an important test when you can sort of know it in your mind and know it in your heart combined and you can move forward confidently. When when I've had key moments in my life where I've had that level of clarity, mental clarity, heart and spiritual clarity coming together, I am no longer uncertain. You, it, it, it's no longer a high risk path, even if it's even if it would be perceived by others to be, you, you're just sure this is the right path. And it's not just out of um, e- ego. E- e- it actually, in order to hear the, the, this voice of conscience, I think you have to get to a place of humility. Uh, you have got to be willing to listen. And as you listen, um, you will fi- he will find, find clarity. And so, and so, you know, essentialism is not about getting more things done. It's not a productivity uh, philosophy. It's about getting the right things done. Uh, and, th- and that is all the difference in the whole world. Because to efficiently do, Drucker said it, to, we, should not, we should not efficiently do that which should not be done at all. You, that that is a tremendous risk is that we are putting tremendous energy into the wrong direction and uh and 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 or or putting tons of energy into a good direction but isn't actually the right path and and so so i think you have to you have to do things to develop this discernment daily practices to develop the discernment and I think that you have to, um, you then have to, you know, use that discernment gift on these questions, on these problems. And 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 actually, you know, I mean, I don't know when people hear it, do they say, oh, very new age or whatever? It doesn't feel new age to me at all. Actually, it's very old agey. It's, uh, it's, you know, this is this is what the greats of all time have always been teaching us. So it's not like it is brand new. But but it's also highly practical what I'm describing. I mean, when when you look at now, this is a very business example. It is a business example. But when you look at like Steve Jobs trying to decide whether to, uh, you know, they were working on the iPad and they they they're developing that, developing, it, developing it. They're ready, you know, they're getting ready to sort of move forward with that as the next product. And they didn't just realize oh we ought to do the iphone first they said we've got to we've got to stop work on the ipad so that we can work on the iphone that's that is that's just the kind of thing that would require a high level of clarity and you can't get to that clarity just by running some numbers in a spreadsheet that can give you hints it can give you some guidance but some a lot of this decision making has to be made intuitively has to be but that doesn't mean intuitively sometimes means in people's mind, in the vernacular, is like um, magically. Well, it's just almost like it's guesswork. No, it's deep work that must be done until you get that discernment, until you get that sense. Yeah, this is the right path. Now, that doesn't mean it's all going to work out, but we feel the path is right. And we can feel that sense of clarity individually and, as it turns out, in that decision inside that business collectively as well.
And so I just, I mean, that's a bit of a jump to suddenly go to a business example from, from where we're at, but I just don't want it to be lost that this is somehow, well, that's fine in that environment, but it doesn't work in this environment. It does work in this environment. Yeah. And, 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 and we just, you know, that it works, it works wherever it's utilized. Yeah. It, it works wherever you want to see breakthrough performance and things that really can make a difference. Uh, I love I love that, and, and even the name you give it about this developing the gift of discernment, I think is something again, like you're saying, giving people language to understand something, or maybe to be able to to do something. And you've talked a little bit about how this practice of journaling, and maybe especially gratitude journaling, is one way we can develop that discernment. What are some other ways you've seen that have been effective, either for yourself or for others you've worked with? You, you, you've got to develop a practice of reading the, the highest, best classic literature that you can. And, and you know, I mean, I, I subscribe to scripture. <laughs> I read that every day. I just recently decided I would read it half an hour a day. Um, I, you know, I'm reading out of, I mean, I'm reading out of the Book of Mormon. I'm reading out of the 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 the, the, the Bible, but I'm also reading other classic literature. I'm also reading historical works. I'm, I'm reading right now um, uh, the John Adams uh, biography by uh, David McCullough. As I'd say, that is a long biography by every estimation. That was one but of my dad's how, favorite books. How rich that book is! How great it is to 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 let your mind wander through the 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 way that the that John Adams is thinking about the world and the problems and, and he is a student of the great literature i mean he's reading in ancient greek in latin yeah so so when you're reading you read what you're really doing is you're you're thinking with somebody else's mind And so if you can choose to read from the greatest minds that have ever lived, the highest, the, the great discerners, the seers of human history, then you're going to start seeing the world and thinking through their lens. And that's really powerful and really important. And contrast that with spending endless time in, you know, I don't know how to describe it, but it's certainly not. It's certainly nothing to compare with that. If you're if you're just sailing through Twitter and you're just reading the news updates, and I you know I do read I do read the news of today. Um, I, I I I do read lots of what's going on in the world. I'm not I'm in, in no way a luddite or somehow saying live uh, out there on the mountain top. We got to live here where where people are, so we can make a difference where people are. But I'm also saying that if that so much of what is dressed up to be news really reads to me like gossip now. Yeah. So so there's a lot of trash, a lot of rubbish, as, it's, as we'd say in England, that that it's surely I can make a trade off between that. Surely I can look at I can look at my phone. There's a you can do it now easily. Uh, under battery in most phones, it will show you how many hours you've spent on different apps this week. Surely I could take a portion of that and read the, the greatest literature that is available to me. I mean, some like, one of my favorite quotes about books is that is that um, books are not entirely dead things. Mm -hmm. And some books, in my experience, and some of the ones I've mentioned today are so far from being dead. I mean, they're so full of life. There's so much light in certain books, and, and, and among them, the ones I've mentioned today, that even if they're just open, not even if I'm not reading them, I feel like there's something in it. And maybe, again, people say, that's a bit crazy, but I think there's, I think some books are full of light. Yeah. And that's what we need. You've got to fill your mind with light so that you can have discernment to see clearly between truth error to see 
between, uh, I mean, the, the, the language of the day, right, is, is between fake and real to see what really is and what we need to pursue. And, and so I, I, I haven't regretted one moment that I've spent reading these books. I feel like they just opened me up. They fill me with a sense of discernment. And, and so you, 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 don't, you can't just say the word discernment. Well, I'm going to have discernment about this. No, you've got to develop it. It's a, that's the core of the discipline pursuit is, is develop that discernment so that you can start to see clearly more clearly than all with all the dust in our eyes that you get through constant social media and so on. If you if you're eating that stuff, then you're going to start seeing the world through that lens. And I think, I, 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 as I say, I think that's the path of the non-essentialist. I, I love that perspective and what you said about when you're reading, you're thinking with someone else's mind. I think that's such a cool cool view. And, you know, it, it calls to mind for me something I've heard one of my teachers, Tony Robbins, talk about with his mentor, Jim Rohn, saying, Tony, you don't need to read every day, just the days you eat, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and making time as busy as Tony is today that he does make, he's, you know, he says he makes time to read at least a half hour every day. So that is, that is great. Yeah. And out of the best books, I mean, you've yeah. got to be careful. Not just good books. I mean, there's so, right, think about it this way. So, like, it, it, how much are you going to read? How many books are you going to read between now and the end of your life? Right? What's the number? There's a number, right? I mean, there's a range. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, for a while, last few years, I've been reading 50, 60 books a year. I've slowed right. way down. So I'm talking maybe maybe 20 a year for another, maybe another hundred books, roughly in my life. Let's see a thousand. I'm sorry. Another thousand. So, so that's it. So a thousand books for the rest of your whole life. Do you think that there are a thousand truly classic, powerful books for you to read? I'll bet I could find them, although they might be kind of in iterations or interpretations of each other. It'd be a stretch, but maybe. No, I think you can do it. I think if you if you go online right now, you could say you could you could start just by saying, okay, what are the thousand books? Just search it. What are the thousand books you got to read in your lifetime? Yeah. And someone will so the, and the list will be there. I mean, I know what you mean. A thousand is obviously a really high number of classic books, but then they're, they're there. And my real point is that is that there's no justification for using up that precious reading time on rubbish, on non-essential stuff. And this is true for reading, but it's also true for the, the, the big life decisions, uh, the, uh, the, the discernment of, of our lives is that there's enough essential, meaning 90% or above important activities, so highly important activities to fill the rest of our lives. Yeah. So therefore, every time I waste my time on a trivial thing, uh, on, on rubbish, every time I'm taking it away from something that actually really mattered. There isn't right. enough time for me to do the essential things, plus all the average things, plus all the trivial things, plus all the actually damaging stuff I could do, and waste my yeah. time on. There isn't time for that. Yeah. So we actually are making trade-offs between things that really matter and things that don't. I mean, I, I, you know, I think, I mean, my own bias, of course, is less but better. So even with what you just said about a thousand books, what I really would be recommending to you to do is to identify the top. Certainly, let's say it's a hundred, but maybe it's ten. Mm -hmm. The most important ten books that you can possibly read. The the deepest books, not just the not just the success literature books. Uh, but the wisdom literature, the stuff, let, let give a test, uh, the stuff that has been around the longest. Mm. Yeah. Because that's the stuff that isn't infiltrated with the non-essentialist ideas of the recent past or of the industrial yeah. revolution. You've got to read something that came before all of that, that has lasted longer than that. So you identify the top 10 and read them again and again and again and again. That, to me, 
is a more essentialist approach. I just spoke with somebody recently who, who I think, I think they read 360 books last year or something. And, and, and I'm, I am not, I'm not highly critical of that pursuit. That's got to be a lot better than um, not reading. <laughs> and it's got to be better than just reading social media updates all, all, all day. But it's too many books to imagine that the purpose is applying and integrating. Right. That, that's, it's an intellectual pursuit. Oh, that's an interesting book. Next book, next book, next book. And, and for me, at least, I believe in this philosophy of less but better. And so what I want is the right books again and again until they become a part of me, until yeah. they change the way I see the world. And I'm, I'm back to the language of before, to, uh, until I am seeing the world the way these great minds saw the world. Yeah, I, I think it's such a beautiful perspective. Let me ask you this about your book, about essentialism. And um, this is a question that Nathan, my good friend Nathan, wanted me to ask. It might be a trick question, <laughs> but here's the question. If you were only able to add one item to your book since its publication, what would it be and why? <laughs> I mean, if, if, I was really, if I was really redoing my book right now, I would, uh, I would shorten it. <laughs> that's, that's what I, I think Nathan was trying to trip you up on that one. How, okay, it's so true. let's go that it's way. It's true, I yeah. would. Okay, so how would I shorten it? Oh, I, I, I would just literally go through it line by line and say, okay, is there, is there, a, is there a more efficient way of saying it? Is there, is there some, something that's just cleaner uh, so, that, so that somebody who's reading it can get it, it in its most condensed form? So, I mean, I think that's it. I don't know how much shorter, but sort of, I sort of think 20 or 30 pages, maybe even 40 pages once you actually take it line by line. So that's yeah. one that's one answer. If I was to reduce it then by 40 pages, it would, it would I then feel like I could share some of the things I've learned since its publication? Um, you know, pr probably the answer is yes to that. And I think that w what the sort of trade off I would then, you know, put in there, I think would be would, would include how do you how do you do this? How do you live essentialism where you have limited control? So, and, and that's in a lot of environments, right? Uh, it, it's true in work. It's true in matrix organizations where people are trying to apply this. It's, it's not easy just to say, well, this is what I think is essential. So I'm doing it and I'm not going to do these other things. That can be very career limiting. So I, I think there'd be more, you know, to, to explore there. How, how do you do it there? But it's also true forget organizations is true in in a marriage in a family i mean everything's a negotiation every and i think there would so i'd 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 want to just deal with that in a richer way um i you know i've learned for example something i've learned is that is that there is a default setting in a lot of people's minds that says you can either give a polite yes or a rude no and those are your only two options so it means that it means that people are going to end up with a lot more polite yeses than they really mean because of those two options they don't want to be the you know they don't want to be the commodity who's always saying no to everything uh, and and what I've learned is there really is such a rich middle and it's the negotiation it's the discussion um to use, I think, an even nicer word, it's the counseling. To counsel together, to sit in counsel. Let's talk about this. To sit in counsel with my wife. Let's 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 talk. Let's explore. Let's work together. Let's not have it be your way, my way. Let's really, um, you know, counsel until we together feel that sense of clarity we've been talking about today. This is the right path. Good. Now we know. Let's pursue it. Um, that takes a lot of patience, but. But it's far more efficient than the alternative to whether it's in a marriage or a family, with my children, whether it's in a corporate environment. Anytime you try to go fast, you try and shortchange clarity and, and, and just simply make a decision rather than get to clarity, right? Because that's definitely not the same thing. Uh, you... you <laughs> What happens is that you pay the price again and again and again 
multiple times down the road um, until eventually you go, okay, well, I guess that wasn't really what we, now let's decide what we really should have done in the first place. Thank you. Okay, so in just a moment, I want to transition to to this lightning round of questions. Before I do, I feel impressed to ask you about life purpose. And to ask you, well, first, I'm curious to know, do you feel you're living your life purpose? Uh, Yes, I do. Yeah. That's awesome. And what counsel would you give someone who they would answer that question with a no? Like, how can they discover it? And again, maybe how can they know when they have or how can they define it? What have you found? And maybe maybe it's useful to ask, how did you arrive? Like, how are you so confident that you are? Maybe that's the advice for others. The, the best thing to know in life is your purpose, right? Uh, to, to, to discern what you came here to do. That's great. Uh, but the next best thing is to know what it isn't. And I think that that is a more realistic place for a lot of people to start. It is to ask, do I, do I feel like this is it? Do I feel like I'm, I'm doing it right now? And if the answer isn't yes, I think the answer is no. Right. right? That, 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 that they go, <clears throat> that doesn't mean they have to quit everything right now uh, in order to, 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 uh, to go pursue it, but at least admit it. Well, this isn't it. And then you start the process as we've just been talking about. Get a journal. Write it down. Start paying attention. When do you feel closer? When do you feel further away? Is this, is this right? Did this feel good today? What was right today? And, and I think that's, that's close to the gratitude question we're talking about. What, what was right today? What felt the right direction today? And, and celebrate every little success on the purpose journey on the essentialist journey. You, that's why the gratitude journal is such a good way to start with it. What's well, anything that was right today? Yeah. Celebrate it, focus on it, give energy to that thing. And then tomorrow you will find more things and you keep going. And the power of cumulative, the, cu- the, the, the power of cumulative consistency around celebrating what was right, what feels correct, what feels like the right direction is really immense. I mean, that's really the thing about this 10,000 items over these years is the momentum that it's built and a sense of, of, uh, of, of, of rightness in, in, in direction. Uh, you know, it grows over time. So, uh, so yes, I mean, I, I think that, I think that's what I would say to people. I mean, we've talked about a couple of the things I feel strongly about and I've learned journaling, wisdom literature daily. I mean, of course, meditation daily, a pause, a start tiny. Uh, I have a friend who is a very successful executive, lots of money, happy, great family, all of this, but was just felt immensely stressed. So in a sense, unhappy despite all the evidences to the contrary. Uh, and so he started this journey of mindfulness. And one of the things he did when he started wanting to, uh, to, to get into meditation, he, he, he said, every time I sit down at my desk, I will breathe three times. Just close my eyes, breathe three times. And I actually even think people should go even simpler than that. You know how people say, uh, you know, take 10 deep breaths, uh, or count to 10. That's it. Count to 10. I think people should just count to one. <laughs> just sit at the desk and just breathe once, but properly. And you start the habit there. If you do that every day, every day, every day, and then every time you sit at your desk, every time, over time, you will be introducing a new practice that starts to get us more centered, more present. Uh, you know, you can only feel this discernment, this sense of clarity in this moment. You can't feel it in the past. You can't feel it in the future. You can only feel it here. So you have to be here to be able to hear it, be able to see it, sense it. Yeah. I want to shift gears and go into this. um, I've got about nine questions. I've designed them to, to be able to be answered briefly, but you can answer them as brief or as long as you want. Okay. So the first one here is using a a phrase other than 
a box of chocolates. So answering with something other than a box of chocolates, please complete the following sentence. Life is like a... Um, I got to get the quote. It's by Jenkin Lloyd-Jones. Okay, I'm going I'm I'm to read the whole thing. Anyone who imagines that bliss is normal is going to waste a lot of time running around shouting that he's been robbed. The fact is that most putts don't drop, most beef is tough, most children grow up to just be people, most successful marriages require a high degree of mutual toleration, most jobs are more often dull than otherwise. Life is like an old-time rail journey. Delays, sidetracks, smoke, dust, cinders and jolts, interspersed only occasionally by beautiful vistas and thrilling burst of speed. The trick is to thank the Lord for letting you have the ride. I love it. Number two, what do you wish you were better at? Um, patience. All right. Number three, if you were required every day for the rest of your life to wear a t-shirt with a slogan on it or a phrase or a saying or a quote or a quip, what would the shirt say? Less but better. Number four, what book other than your own have you gifted most often? Throughout my whole life? Sure. Um, <laughs> the Book of Mormon. <laughs> that's the true answer to that question. I mean, that's, uh, the, 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 you know, it gets a, they did an interesting experiment recently because a lot of people just have lots of weird ideas about what's in that. And uh, they, they did an experiment where they had people of all different backgrounds, all different cultures, everything, just read one page. They didn't know what they were reading, just had to read a page from it and underline whatever spoke to them. It is really powerful. You can watch the videos online of just people from different cultures, different countries, just re- responding to what's actually in it. It's just, it's just, it's just a powerful book, and that's and that's it. Nobody else has to think so. Um, but that's that's the book I've ended up telling people. So that's the truth. All right, number five. So, as you've already said, all these conferences at which you speak, fifty, sixty a year, and everything else you have going on. Uh, you travel a ton. What's one travel hack, you know, something you do or maybe something you take with you when you travel to make your travel less painful or more enjoyable? Um, my travel hack is is that I use a checklist uh, before I go. So I literally have a checklist. And, and so my, I can pack really, really quickly. Um, uh, half, not half, but a, many of those items are permanently packed. So I just have doubles of lots of things. But I always do the checklist because no matter how familiar I think I am with it and how habitual it is, and I'm sure I could pack without the list, it's just amazing which things I will forget if I don't have it. And so by, by parallel, I actually think there's lots of things in life that need a checklist. Uh, and, uh, yeah, of course there's a great book checklist manifesto, uh, that, that illustrates this in, in hospitals, um, uh, that, that massive like numbers of lives are saved. If you, you if you use checklists in hospitals, checklist, yeah. wash your hands. Oh yeah. I didn't wash my hands. You could go through the checklist and actually do it. And so for travel, I've, uh, uh, I find a, I find that checklist and, and, and I've also started taking it with me when I, when I, with me, when I travel. So that when I'm leaving to come home, I just go through the checklist again. So that you, don't, you don't forget anything. Yeah. Wow. I've started using a checklist for travel a couple of years ago, but I never thought about using it for coming home. That is really, really right, because, smart. Yeah. Because it, you just think you've got everything. And instead of actually just looking around the, the hotel room, okay, is it are we clear? You just go through it item by item. Brilliant. That's there so great. Go. Awesome. Um, what's one thing you've started or stopped doing in order to live or age well? Yeah. Okay. Um, I stopped, uh, all sugar. Wow. Good for yeah, you. Yeah. All added sugar. Uh, and I, st- I, I did that, um, New Year's Eve. So we're whatever, seven months in now. Even ice cream? <laughs> especially ice cream 
<laughs> that was cow. the first. That was the reason I did it. Because <laughs> ice cream was my ice cream was my weakness. I found uh, kind of a and... balance. I only eat ice cream <laughs> on the full moon. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I love that you like. You're waiting. Is it out yet? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's That's almost funny. a full moon. I think I can do it tonight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for me, for me, I would find it much harder to eat, to only – well, I like what you're saying. I could imagine doing that after this year. My goal is to do a year. We'll see. But I think if I started doing, eating it a bit, it would be all over for me. Yeah, me too. That's me too. <laughs> if, if I – if I, I love Ben and Jerry's and, and, uh, it, and I think if I just said, okay, I'll just eat a bit. I'm going to go eat a bit now. Just, I know that's my rule, but I'll eat a bit. Oh no, that's it. It's all over. I think it's easier just to do, to do none. Yeah. So, uh, so there you go. So that's a uh, sign yeah, of wisdom. That's one thing. Okay. Awesome. So number seven, what's one thing you wish every American knew? Oh, I mean, uh, <clears throat> serious work, serious understanding of the founding fathers. Really like, really knowing, knowing their history to see so that you can see our moment with some perspective. I mean, I, I, I think, I think that the most important five years in American history are the, are the last five years. <laughs> so many things are going on. And I think, I think if you could, if people could see today through the end lens of the found of the founding fathers it, it, and and i don't mean a um i, I do not mean a, a right-wing reading of that or a left-wing reading of that i, I don't mean the politics of, of now i mean i mean one of the things as i reading the, the john adams uh, uh biography is is how polarized it was on every issue i mean it was it was brutal in lots of ways so that's com that there's a commonality about that but to learn why they did what they did and what they were grappling and what big issues they were confronting and, and what, why those things mattered. I mean, they, they, these, these, these people were serious students of human nature and, and, and human nature's weakness and follies and so on. I think that I think that, that seems, seems like a, a good idea. Uh, yeah. Besides, besides, one of the funny things uh so so of course being an englishman uh on july 4th in america is always an interesting experience and uh and and somebody always wants to say something about it you know uh, which is fine but they yeah you know, they always want to say well what's it like in england today you know what are they all saying today in england and the answer is nothing there's no there, there's no, no nobody is mad about july 4th nobody's Nobody is even thinking about it. The day comes and passes. It's just a complete non-event. But then I also always want to point out to people, if they would read their history, they would find that in the early days of what became the War of Independence, uh, people, people understood, the people that were involved in that conflict were, saw what was happening as a civil war. They self-identified as Englishmen, and they were fighting Englishmen. So mm -hmm. in the early days, so uh, you know the the, um, the, the what that means, <laughs> if you will follow the logic, is that either way, whichever way you look at it, the English won. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a total what, perspective shift. And what a fine job we've been making of it ever since. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's the biggest colony you've got. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, that's that's just a that's just. I mean, it's true actually, but it, 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 yeah. the, the the idea that it was seen as a civil war, but uh, but yes, I I would I would wish for that. I would wish go go read the history, study it again. Get alive at it. Learn about Hamilton. Learn about Jefferson. Really understand the comp complexities facing uh, Washington. Uh, learn about how easily we could have had a monarchistic system even after the War of Independence. How easily it could have changed. How how deeply divided the founding fathers were about 
about the powers of the states and the and the republic, uh, the the federalist system and how it was going to work and how to balance those forces and how deeply divided they were uh, as they tr- grappled with these ideas. This is all important, and and I think is its own antidote to to well gives perspective to the challenges of our day, which are which are, are of, of, a, of a different kind now, and it gives it some perspective. Um, so, yeah. Uh, thank you for that that perspective. I think that's really amazing. So what's your next big – oh, wait. Before I get to that, your next big project, last, last question in the lightning round here. Uh, what's one piece of advice your parents have given you that has stayed with you? Um, well – it was, I always say it was about 20 years ago, but really it was about 19 years ago, just over now, when I was staring at a piece of paper in my hands with all these answers to the question, what would you do if you could do anything? And I was visiting the United States at the time and had just got out of a meeting where somebody had said, look, if you do, do decide to stay in America, then you should come and help us with this committee. And I walked away from that meeting suddenly aware I could choose to do something different than I'm doing. So consistent with everything we've been talking about, that that you don't have to do what you've been doing in the past. And um, and so I'm, I'm sitting there brainstorming and I'm looking at all the things I would do. And I noticed that not what I've written down, especially, but what I haven't written down, I suddenly see that law school is not on my list if I would do anything. And I was at the time at law school. So you know, decided I'd call my parents, call England. My mother answers. She listens for a while. Says, "I think you better talk to Dad." He talks to me. He listens, which is not entirely like him. And then he said two things. He said, "Son," he said, "To thine own self be true," which is a quote from. Shakespeare's Hamlet. Laity is actually speaking to his son. Um, and uh, and then he added this. He said, he said, do what is right. Let the consequence follow. That, that, that's even more than the to thine self be true. That line is, is the real summary, right? The, this, this is, again, consistent with everything we've been talking about. You know, the, the core of essentialism is to do the right things for the right reasons at the right time and let the consequences follow. And non-essentialism is do everything that's popular now. Those are the two. That's the two. Those are the two. Approaches. And really, back then, in the moment of should I quit law school or not, you know, he didn't say, which he could have said, uh, what's your plan, son? What are you going to do? Now, he, he, did, he did go on to ask me some questions. I don't really remember what they were, but it wasn't what he, how he began. It, he could have said, well, look, come on, finish what you've started. Do another couple of years of it, then see where things are at. He said, do what is right, let the consequences follow. Do the right thing. Let's see where it goes. Consistently do the right thing. Consistently get your discernment right. Follow that path and see what what will come. Sounds like a wise man. That's great. So, what's your next project? What either what are you in the middle of, or what are you what are you about to start? Um, about um, a little while ago. Uh, but actually, right after I'd finished writing Essentialism before it came out, I had I took um, went on a family vacation, two and a half weeks without access to Wi-Fi or cellular coverage, so completely unplugged, which you know is pretty rare and actually decently hard to do now. Uh, in, in one sense, right? Because it's you have coverage everywhere. And while I was there, uh, I was I was reading a, a classic book. As I remember reading Anna Karenina uh, on that trip, 
And it was just a kind of unplugged from from all the normal things. I'm writing my journal. I'm still, uh, you know, that's the that's the kind of environment. It was very it was a very relaxing experience, uh, but it was also just uh, disconnected uh, from from all the noise. And in the middle of that, I had a a very vivid insight, a clear moment of clarity that of what I needed to do next. And uh, and it was big, and it was different, and I didn't even quite know what to make of it at first. Even now, sometimes I'm I'm still surprised, even even with what's followed. And it was it was basically to to pursue something in television. Uh, there was more to it than that, but that's enough for this conversation. It was it was quite vivid. It was quite specific, um, but I knew that it was a long term idea. Uh, I, I knew it wasn't like something I was going to suddenly do in the next three months. It, you know, the book hadn't even come out. I knew I had to do a lot of work to get the book to come out. You, you want the book to actually be successful. You want it to become a New York Times bestseller, if possible, and to and then to continue after that so it isn't just a one-hit wonder. Um, there's a lot of work to be done, but all the while in the background, there's this new intent. Um, and I remember I got to a point after essentialism had had done really well and was sort of established and was just going to just continue to, to do well that it, I suddenly wanted to do the next book I wanted to but I could feel there was a disconnect between what I wanted and, and this feeling of consciousness I say no it's not the time yet it might be the right thing it might even be the right idea it's just not the right time and so I put the whole thing on hold it was within like weeks of that decision, that trade off that uh, Steve Harvey um, read Essentialism and blogged about it. And he said, uh, this book changed my life. And because I wasn't so focused on uh, writing the next book, there was enough space to see that as a, as a window of opportunity to connect and to, to, to talk further. And so ended up doing an appearance with him on his show uh, in Chicago, and it wasn't like other media I'd done before. This was like really rich. Uh, I mean, he's just talking about, look, really, this changed my life so much, and this is how it changed my life. And and we took questions from the audience. It's very rich experience in trying to share these ideas to to um, to a broad audience. Uh, you know, to of course millions of people in that moment, and it, and it went well enough that we carried on doing appearances. And so we went from, you know, went from just really making no progress to suddenly within the next you know few months there just suddenly were things happening and getting agents and and understanding this world a little bit better and so then we we it's it's continued to impact us we've moved now to uh, to to an area just outside of LA we're in uh, San Fernando Valley in a in a lovely area and um and and I can just feel this is like the right path, and yeah, I don't I don't everything I've ever done has taken takes a long time. Uh, any any big game changing objective uh, it takes just takes time. It just takes a while, and it's okay. I actually feel relatively patient, uh, which is as I already mentioned something that I'd like to be good at. But I can feel this is this is all right. We're in the right path. So that's the, that's the next big thing. That's the next. I thing. love it, and I'm I love the part of this story where you consciously created the space, and then what showed up. That's, that's so beautiful. So, at this point, I want to ask. So, I do have a few more questions specific to writing. I know that not everyone listening is necessarily interested in writing, so I like to kind of do a, a pseudo wrap up at this point. Um, by doing two things. One is uh, letting you know that as a way of expressing my gratitude to you, Greg, for uh, making the time to talk with me today, I've made a um, $100 loan through Kiva.org to nice. a, a woman entrepreneur in India named Bala, who's 54 years old. Her household has five members. She'll use this money to buy jewelry to help uh, improve the quality of life for her for her family and in her community. Nice. So, I love that you've done that. That's terrific. Yeah. And the other thing that I, that I want to do is, is just um, ask you if people want to learn more from you or connect with you, what's the best way for them to do that? 
you know, I, I mean, LinkedIn is a, is actually not a bad place. Uh, that's a, a platform that uh, that I've ended up writing a lot on and communicating on as one of their influences, one of the original influences for that group. Uh, and uh, um, or in or in any you know any of the social medias that I have tapped into Twitter or or the website gregmcewan.com, any of those places. Awesome. But really, honestly, the 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 best thing is is to read essentialism that's really where i would point people back to it's where i go back to and i think it's just it's just can we to take the time to read it that's been my biggest compliment in fact the biggest surprise in writing essentialism has been how many people in fact an agent just like a very successful agent here um in los angeles uh just told me that he he said he'd read the book 17 times Oh, uh, yeah, he says he just listens to it on the way to work and back again, like again and again and again. And that, although that is extreme, it is surprisingly familiar uh, with how many people have understood it. And it's been so, so great that they've gone, yeah, it's not something you can read once. You've got to go back to it. It's a disciplined pursuit. And that really has been what people have done. Very almost daily, I either get emails or, or see on social media someone saying, "Oh yes, I'm on my second time, my third time. I just found it, but I'm already starting over again. So this time I'm taking notes as I go through it." This, this is this is compliments them, not me. It's it, it's saying that they they get the idea that essentialism is either a disciplined pursuit or nothing. It, mm. It's it's not a it's not a hey, I got exposed to this idea at the end. Uh, so for those that get it, I think that that's, that's how they, they, they demonstrate they do. Oh, no, that's great. So as I transition now to just a few questions about the writing process itself, um, let me start by asking you this. When you were writing the book um, and as you were completing it, I know there's this special – most writers share that there's this kind of almost magical feeling, a combination of relief and anticipation when you complete – a draft of a manuscript. So right around this time when you felt like you were maybe nearing one of the finish lines of a project, um, how, how much of a sense did you have at how big it would ultimately be? Um, uh, you know, I, I was, I, I just didn't know. I mean, I just, you just don't know. Uh, I, I, I was always worried. Um, I still am. I'm just just very early days, starting to feel that the timing might be right to start working on the next uh, on the next book. And um, and I have the same sensation now with this I did on on, on with essentialism, which is uh, this thing could just this thing is just likely just to die um, because that's what happens. That's what happens to books. Right? That's not. Yeah. That's not the exception. That's what happens, right? I mean, someone quoted the statistic that 400,000 people, 400,000 books will be published in the US uh, this year. And with all the new platforms, maybe it's even higher than that now. I, but 400,000, I mean, we talked about before, right? Even at an extreme level, you can read a, a thousand books for the rest of your life. So for those 400,000, the, the, the vast majority, we will never hear of, never see, never become aware so the just the statistics of that mean that the chance of of a book dying and even even successful books basically launch you try and get as high as you can on the launch and then you know then you slowly or quite quickly see the whole thing die off and that is the thing so yeah. for something to follow a different path than that is really rare and so to have so I was just, I mean, I was just worried about that, that, that this thing might not spike very high and then might die really fast <laughs> um, <laughs> or might just be received really badly. You know, that just people would just not appreciate it or just, just, you know, just don't, either don't care. I mean, I think that's the biggest concern is that you just, people go, oh yeah, but I'm busy. So yeah. on to the next thing. So it's been so, so, so happy blessing to see it just continue and uh, and really, over time, it, 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 it has, in general, it has actually increased. So it's very, very unusual. And uh, to feel very, 
feel quite humbled by that actually, because it, it all all the statistics, you know, all chance, all likelihood, it would have just been over and out. Yeah, no doubt. Um, so we talked about this just briefly earlier in this conversation, but about this intense focus you applied to get this book written. And uh, if I if I remember accurately what you wrote about how you got it done, 5 a.m. to 1 p.m., five days a week for nine months. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's the gist of it. I can't, I can't remember exactly the times. If it was 5 to 1 or 5 till noon or something, but, um, but it was the gist of it, yeah. Uh, and it was 5 a.m. I mean, that, that's correct. Um, sometimes even earlier than that, sometimes. So, I mean, first of all, I mean, I have to acknowledge that I couldn't have done this without being in alignment with my wife, right? Like, we have children, and so it really meant that for that nine months, I was missing the morning, the whole morning routine completely. Uh, so it meant that what it did mean is following that schedule meant that by the time the children were coming home, I was available and I was there. Um, and so, so there was lots of it wasn't actually a family unfriendly period. You know, there's a lot of acknowledgements in books that say things like, thank you to my family for having me absent for two years, you know, kind of thing. And it wasn't that, um, we, you know, we, it was actually a family strengthening period, which was nice because that's consistent with the subject. Um, but it, but it still took, you know, it still took getting into that routine and by the end of the process, I mean, I find it hard to write. I think writing is hard um, because what's hard, it's not putting words on a piece of paper, especially hard. It is thinking that's hard. It is clarifying. I mean this, not this. And not clarifying it for other people. Once it's clear enough to you, it can be quite, it, it's sort of easy-ish, easy-ish to communicate that to other people. What's hard is getting clear yourself. Yeah. I found that I found that process hard. Um, still do uh, same same with the, the with the new work, and um, but by the end of the process, I really missed it. I felt it was so productive to sit and be in that kind of act of creation every day. You are you are bringing forth something. That didn't exist before. That is such a feeling of that was so satisfying. Always hard is as, as a, a quote that I like is uh, is that everybody nobody likes to write. Everybody likes to have written. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and that's right. Right. Once you get things clarified, said, described, done, edited, you go, oh, okay. Look at that. I'm so pleased with that. But the journey, getting there. Yeah. Well, then tell me if this is your experience. My experience, I just spent 18 weeks drafting a manuscript. It turned out to be 108,000 words. I'd never produced that volume of work in such a short period. And I, right. too, miss it. It's been about three weeks that I've been out of my routine. And for me, it was a lot of overnights. I'd start at 9 p.m. and write until 9 or 10 a.m. On a, on a Saturday night to the Sunday morning. Um, right. But my experience with writing is writing itself never gets easier I do think the quality gets better, but the act of writing, especially forcing myself to sit down and begin, it, it, that never went away. Do you find that that's true for you as well? That it always remains somewhat of a difficult, emotionally difficult process to put your to butt in the chair? To write itself? Yeah, to just yes. sit down and do it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's, yeah. uh, it's, the, it's, the, uh, the, it's the power lifting of thinking. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I've had this thought, I love that description, the power of thinking, thinking, because lately, and I honestly, I had this thought last night and I didn't follow it, but I've thought, I wonder if I went and did push-ups to exhaustion just over and over like three to five sets to train myself to just exert myself. Now, of course that's physically, but I found that was what I was endeavoring to do mentally when I was writing. Oh, it's yeah. like, and I go, no, I don't want to go subject myself to that. <laughs> no, I, I think that any kind of any kind of thinking work is easier than than good writing than solid writing. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not so hard to it's not that hard to do bad writing. 
just sit right stuff, but that's not satisfying. Um, but no, I mean, absolutely. If I, you know, I think about all the, all the work that'll be on my, you know, that, that, that I could get to today. And, you know, you can send the emails, you can, you can work through paperwork, you can take meetings, you can have phone calls, you can do this podcast. I mean, this stuff is so much easier. Yeah. than the sitting down, stay there, keep staring, keep working, keep thinking, keep get asking, what's the question you're really trying to answer? What's the I mean, this is, uh, yeah, absolutely. And to get to clarity, again, I mean, it's what we've been talking about. It's that what we've been saying is the work of life. I mean, as, the, as, the, as, an, as an author, right, the clarity in writing is the work of a writer. Yeah. And, uh, and, and to, 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 to say something that is not just clear, but is also new, fresh, and hearable. Right. It's, uh, I, I just don't know much, much that's harder. Uh, you know, I, I, if you want to write something that is true, basically true, that's not fresh, easy, right? Yeah. To say, I just talked to somebody recently, a little while ago, again, somebody actually I really admire, uh, effective leader. He said, he said, oh yeah, I just, uh, I just wrote, <laughs> I just wrote a, 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 a new book. Actually, what he said, what he said was, he said, I just came out with a new book. He said, I, I figured if you could do it, I could do it. <laughs> That's what he actually said. <laughs> like, what does said. that mean? Wow. What he actually said. And I was like, I was like, ah. And then in the moment, I didn't really, I didn't really, <laughs> there was a little, perhaps a little slight in it. I don't know. But nevertheless, <laughs> when he told me the title, I was disappointed for him immediately. I didn't, I mean, I'm not saying, am I going to say that it's too late to give any observation about that, but I was disappointed for him because I knew that feels like 20 other books that have already been written. Yeah. So it, I believe what he's written. Like I believe it before I've even read it. He, he, he's, he's credible to me. He's, he's got a lot of experience. He, so I want, I want that book to go to masses of people, but it's not mm-hmm. going to, that was my prediction anyway. My hypothesis, as soon as I heard the title, oh, that's, we've all, everybody's heard that before. And that's, as, that is exactly what's gone on to happen with that. So, and that's, that is, of course, based on the statistics we already talked about, 400,000 books, that's going to happen to most books. But I think it's, I think there are lots of things you can do if you're willing to pay the, the price to yeah. improve your odds. Uh, and, and, but it's, but it's, uh, you know, uh, um, was Churchill said, uh, said that writing uh, a book has five predictable phases. And the first phase is it's a plaything. And in the fifth stage, by the fifth stage, it's a tyrant. Hmm. And I, I also feel that. And I think most people want the play thing and sometimes the book comes out while it's still a play thing the work wasn't really done the price wasn't really paid to go beyond writing as a bucket list item right i want to write a book and secretly of course most people who write a book want it to go on to become a, a huge bestseller sure you know but in order for it to work and all the different, there's so many levels of things you have to do and work that must be done in order for the final thing to actually resonate, be relevant, be worded correctly. I mean, this is, this is, uh, yeah. Anyway, I mean, we'll see, right. We, I, I'm, I'm in, I'm in that phase again right now. I, 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 I think the chance of failure is, is very high and be, and, yeah. and the success of essentialism doesn't, doesn't, make me in the least bit confident on this one it doesn't make me go oh listen you know everyone who read essentialism they'll they'll care about this next book so we'll be fine no i just don't i've seen how often that isn't the case people judge you based on their own thing does that seem like something they want to read right now is that relevant to them right now and if it's not then they'll go on to the next you know one of the four hundred thousand. Yeah, absolutely. What are you mentioned that there are things that 
that we can do as writers to increase the likelihood that this resonates with our readers or that it finds success? W- what are some of those things? Um, first thing, must get into the mind of the reader you know, in, in, a, in a couple of strong ways. Uh, you know, number one mistake I think uh, authors and would-be authors make is that they get consumed with their own idea. So they say, this idea is so good, so true, so important, so needed. That's we have. That's why I'm writing it. It's gonna. Everybody's gonna read it. Mm-hmm. And people don't buy what they need. They buy what they want. So that's the biggest single disconnect. Someone goes, the world needs this, and I'm writing a book about it out of deep passion. Great. So now they've written it on some subject that people need, but that is not the buying process. The buying process is almost polar opposite to that. It is busy in my life, doing my own stuff. Oh, I want that. It's a want. Yeah. It's an instant want. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, like a, almost the same reason people – a lot of people buy, uh, you know, gum is there, or a magazine is there. Leave. It's an impulse. So you got to get your head into the impulse moment. Why should somebody want this thing right now? And answer that question. I think that's much harder to do in a fresh way. Yeah. Uh, so that somebody doesn't just go, oh, I want it. They go, oh, oh, that's interesting. I want that. And it's fresh. Oh, so now I'm open. Uh, that, that that's about title, subtitle, and cover design. It's a you know that's thinking about it as a product, and uh, and that that is all about relevancy. And and uh, you know I, I if I if I had a real formula for it, I would share it, and I would also use it. Um, it's but it's uh, you know it's 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 art and science, yeah. and. Um, but I think that's one of the really big things. A lot gets lost there. A lot of sure. good content doesn't work because of that. And I'm making it highly relevant. So somebody create almost a physical reaction. I want that now. Even almost before they've thought about what it even is, even before they know what's in the book, just I want that now. That's what we're going for. That, that reminds me of what I heard Jack Canfield talk about. He did with Chicken Soup for the Soul. And how it went on to do a half billion copies is mm-hmm. he talked about the cover design and actually muscle testing people's response upon seeing the cover. And did they, were they strong? Did they go weak? What, what did they say about it? That's so that's interesting. Well, the, the, their, their intent was, was absolutely right. Mega best-selling title, mega best-selling title, mega best-selling title. That was like, they used to say it to each other as they were going through the process. What is it? Is it and because they didn't just want a title, they wanted a mega best selling title and they got yeah. it. And it was, it was very, very clever. And it wasn't the only reason that it was successful. They then went on to do all the hard work of the, you know, the, 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 I remember Stephen Covey's marketer once told me, uh, we worked, uh, you know, three years, day and night to make the seven habits an overnight success. Wow. And I, 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 I subscribe to that too. So it's a combination but I also know if you get those first things wrong, if, if, if people just don't actually want it, you can't put that right later. You, right. you just cannot get people to pay attention to something they don't, they're just not interested in. And right. so you have to create in people, you know, the, the old uh, phrase from how to win friends and influence people, you have to create in people an eager want. Ooh, I'm stressing myself out talking about it. <laughs> well, we're about to wrap up, so we won't we won't stew in the stress too much, uh, and and we'll end on a good note. Uh, I am curious when it comes to marketing. I know many people think getting the book, getting the manuscript written, is the finish line, and as we know, it's not. Right. And anybody who's not thinking about the marketing of the book, I mean, if they're writing it for themselves or their posterity, that's one thing. But if you want people to read it and be impacted by it, you've got to be thinking about the marketing while you're drafting the book. And with what you've learned in your career about marketing books, if there was like one thing that stood out, like if there was only one thing somebody could do to give themselves a great chance at having this book be bought and read, or just say, say bought, what would it be? 
Um, I mean, look, you, you've got to have some kind of, you've got to have some kind of, um, uh, of, of, of platform of a group of people that are going to get you going. I mean, this is a, you, you, the game, the game of all, all success, I think is about building momentum. Uh, you know, it's having quick wins and then turning those quick wins into, into the next level set wins, set of wins and so on. And, um, and so, you know, you, 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 so many things to answer the question. You have to one thing. You look, I, I, um, I, I'm coming to the idea from what you're saying. Like I'm reminded of, of Apple's approach with products that, you know, so there's two big things, right? Especially when Steve is around, certainly in his own head, he's going, it's about product and it's about marketing. It's not about sales. It's about product and marketing. So you've got to make a product that you are really proud of. And if you don't do that, if you haven't got those things right, and we've already talked a lot about that, then you, the, the, then there's no, then you're in the problem after that of trying to sell something to somebody, trying to say you do want this and you don't know why you want it, but I'm going to tell you why you want it. And, and it's like heavy work forever afterwards, expensive, heavy work that's probably not going to be successful. So you've got to get the product right. But then marketing is, is it's, you know, it's, it's, I mean, the thing, the thing that I'm wanting to say isn't necessarily a very transferable point. Uh, port isn't necessarily very portable, but but I re I remember I wrote a, a book when I was at college, like a college project, self published. That was the first thing I really ever wrote. It wasn't very good, um, and uh, didn't do very well. But I mean, at the time, it felt like it was an, its own achievement, and really, I learned a lot. So it wasn't like at the time. I mean, even looking back, I think, gosh, that really was an accelerating experience. But one of the things I learned is that the book was the kind of book that somebody would read. And I even got letters saying, oh, I read this and I really, it really touched me. And I, I felt like it did make a difference to people. But it was the kind of book that somebody read and then they passed to someone else maybe. Mm -hmm. And when somebody, in fact, somebody told me that one time, they said, oh, yes, I read the book. And, I, and then I gave it to my nephew or something. And I thought at the time, I thought, well, that's not a very good sign. <laughs> <laughs> it's better than being ignored but i thought you don't really want somebody to read it once and then go okay done with that i got that go you need somebody to say i got the book i'm reading it a second time i'm on the third time and, and i've told everybody i know to read it that's what you yeah. really need that's the effect you're going for and that's the real marketing that works because that really is how everything then goes i mean that's how i mean how did you come across the book what happened you read it two and a half years ago how did that happen to be honest, I, I don't even remember. I don't yeah. even remember where it came into my life. And then I bought it. I just downloaded it on Kindle and read it. So it'd be fun if you could remember just for the conversation. But but nevertheless, the, the, there's no reason you should be able to remember it. But it, it, it is a word. But somebody recommended it. I mean, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't like, oh, I saw a Facebook ad or something. It was somebody told me about it. And I was like, well, oh, it, it, yeah, it's impossible. It's impossible for you to have uh, <laughs> you seen a Facebook ad because there, there, no, there were no Facebook ads. Um, right. It wasn't. But there was there was really no. There has been no selling of it in that sense. Uh, there's not been a you know discounted on this day so that you can. It, it, it's it's it has reached a certain point of just of just word of mouth, right? Uh, and then yep. I get yep. to get invited by you to be on this, and and so so that's its own own continued conversation. So I think that's that's what I'm saying. You get the product, hopefully the product works so that you can start and spark a conversation. And then the marketing journey is to continue that conversation. And what is yep. what to me is an electric thought is that that there are people out there right now, people today, someone somewhere is having this conversation. And I love that. I love that the book has a life of its own now. That yeah. In the time we've been talking here, people will have emailed the website saying, I'm reading the book right now, and these are my questions, and this is what I'm doing with them. This is who I've just shared it with. And that, 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 that's, that's so cool to me. 
Yeah. Years ago, I was um, I, I was introduced to the idea right, of multiple streams of income you want uh-huh. in life, multiple streams of income, income that flows to you whether you're awake or not, right? Um, and that's kind of a powerful idea too, but it grew in me the idea of, of a residual, well, yeah, residual stream of income. And, and I thought, what about residual streams of goodness? Mm. Like what what could you do once that, goodness was happening again and again because of it. And, and, and I just, I just is so delighted that to some extent in some tiny way, essentialism that that happens and that a book can do that. Um, that somebody out, somebody's having a good experience right now. Somebody's having something happen to them in a positive way while we're having this separate conversation. That's exciting to me. That, that totally yeah. makes me think of that saying that somebody's sitting under the shade now because someone planted a tree a long time ago. Yeah, it's cool, isn't right. it? That's, that's I beautiful. like that. Okay, so last thing, last thing as we wrap up, um, if you were to give just one piece of encouragement, even if it was just like a little keep attaboy, you know, something like that, what would you say to somebody who's maybe in the middle of their project or they, they just haven't quite gotten over the hump to start it? Yeah. Uh, writers write. Writers right. That's it. I love it. That, that you, you don't have to, you don't declare yourself. Someone else doesn't declare yourself a writer. Mm-hmm. You declare yourself a writer, not in words, but with a pen to paper or fingers to the keyboard, and you are writing. And now you're a writer. And yeah. and I suppose. The opposite is also true, which is as soon as you stop writing, you're no longer a writer. You know, it's, it's, I actually did that for a little while. For a while, I, I really wasn't writing. And I felt like I suppose, I think I felt good about that. There was, there was enough other things going on. But it's nice to be back into writing. There's something, all that's challenging about it, it's just very stabilizing. You're doing the thing, part of what you came here to do. So I love that. You know. Okay, so final, final thing is, Greg, what's it like? <laughs> How fun is it to open royalty checked? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, funny you should say it because I literally got the email yesterday for the, for the latest uh, installment, and um, yeah, it was uh, that's that 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 hasn't got old yet. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. I love it. Well, yeah, good. I mean, I, I you know, it's. Uh, it's yeah what i want what i really want yeah all right that was the final final thing but what i really really want is <laughs> is for a book and, and you want this for you too is a book that lasts for a long long time right for sure and i by that i don't mean a decade either which is oh this is like mega long time in the publishing world already but i mean like a hundred years from now I really like – that's like my highest aspiration for essentialism. Mm. And I, I don't know that it that, – that is, that is a big aspiration really. But that – if I want, if essentialism is still in print, still working 100 years from now, right? I'm not here anymore. You're not here anymore. We're gone. But the book carries on. Yeah, that's yeah. – th- that's cool. I that's what I think you might have done it, my friend. I think you might have done it. Well, Time will tell. We, we just, all, all we've got is 96 years left uh, before we'll know. <laughs> yes. I'm on. I'm on for it. Longevity science. Here we go. <laughs> Love it. What, awesome. what a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for your time yeah. today. Thanks for, for, for yeah. involving me in this. No, this has been so fun. Thanks for accepting the invitation. And thank you to everybody listening. Uh, I I really hope this has been enjoyable for you and that you've taken away at least a half dozen things that are going to improve the quality of your life and your writing and, by extension, uh, making the impact that you came here to make. I want to encourage you to get that book written or stay with the one you've got in process. Even if you don't know what the heck it is, go for it your words can do a lot of good for a lot of people. I invite you to take a look in the show notes, find some of the links to things that Greg and I talked about, resources that'll be valuable for you in your own journey and in your own projects. And I want to invite you to visit goodliving.com. Connect with me. I'm launching now the Life's Best Practices Guided Coaching Program. 
If you're interested to be a part of that, these are distinctions, insights, skills, tools that I've learned over the last seven years of studying leadership and personal improvement that I would love to share with you. Until then, take care.